Well, hey gang, Dr. J, Steve Jensen from the National Sales Academy and Impact Training Corporation. And today we have our special Nutrition Tips Tuesday. And uh, who else other than Jamie Hayes is going to be helping us through that journey. And the last two sessions have been absolutely fabulous. Uh, feedback has been great. Tons of YouTube hits. So welcome, Jamie. Thanks for helping our crew and our tribe uh, in the sack. Hey, Steve. Uh, let's hope that we can make a difference this morning. And we've had just a little bit of a chin wag with a couple of the guys that have joined us today. So I, I'm really uh, excited about what we're going to talk about today. So what do you... How are we going to take us on the journey today? What do you think was, uh, 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 let's say, a segue on what we did last time? Because we covered so much with exercise and uh, immune systems and carbohydrate tolerances and so forth over the last two sessions and how to lose weight. Um, what are we going to speak about today? Well, Steve, this week I, I actually completed a survey to rate whether my diet was healthy. And uh, I, I'm 67 years of age. I'm strong, fit, lean unmedicated, you know, I have a, like a 31 inch waist and I scored out of 73, I scored 13. Whoa. 13 out of 73. So uh, this, did that mean that I was actually unhealthy? Because if we look at how I'm scoring, which means uh, I'm fit, I can run up the stairs, I can carry heavy things, uh, participate in sport, not only play with my Grown up children, I can play with my grandchildren, get up and down, you know, uh, with no problems, and I've got pretty constant energy throughout the day. But I scored 13 out of 73. Now, does that mean that there's something wrong with me, or there was something wrong with the guidelines upon which they were based? And I actually suspect it was something wrong with the guidelines upon which they were based. Because if I look at the evidence of how my scoring health wise, you know, my blood profile's fine, my blood sugar's fine, my blood cholesterol's fine, you know, um, uh, my waistline's fine. So uh, clearly uh, there's something wrong with what we regard as a healthy diet. And, and Steve, I've got to congratulate you. The screen share that you have behind you, to me, that looks like a pretty healthy diet. That, that, that pretty well defines exactly what I eat most days you know I can't see any steak there but um but apart from, oh yes it, it's there well done thank you yep that's where uh, my head that's is that's fantastic you know <laughs> maybe I should do that <laughs> and do you, do you realize and just uh, I want to point this out if somebody just ate what's on Steve's screen sharing there I guarantee they'd be healthy and would I have to teach them about how to read food labels no because none of the foods on the screen behind Steve have any food labels. So what the first tip of this morning, when you go to the supermarket and hopefully you do go to the supermarket or the green grocer or the butcher or the fishmonger or what like that. But if you go to the supermarket shop around the periphery, cause that's where the fresh food is. You know, that's where the meat, the, the fish, the eggs, the vegetables and fruits and things like this, and they don't have any labels. So if you shop around the periphery, Avoid that central section and you know how they've got these big displays of, you know, you see people putting in their trolley, you know, a case of Coke or Diet Coke or whatever like that. Just avoid all that stuff, you know, that, that they are just poisoning themselves and their children and their children are, I hate to see it, you know, putting on that muffin top, that tummy fat and, uh, unfortunately losing teeth you know children losing teeth that's absolutely criminal absolutely criminal so so when it comes uh, down to that um uh, a little bit of a tip there is if it comes out of the ground or it's grown uh, on the land and that's probably the best things to eat because you know um because it will go in and come out and they'll actually give you nutrition and all the other things with the labels on it and i'm not talking about pricing labels are we we're talking about all the the food content labels um it's not natural produce which means that has additives and and so forth so um uh that's a good tip because i think another thing you said last time is if you can eat it with a knife and fork it's going to be better for you. Absolutely. You get rid of the, the bread on either side of it. It's what's inside it makes the difference. Yeah, so so think least... knife and fork, not hands. So as soon as you have, you know, you're picking up with your hands, it's like convenience food. It's a pie, pizza, chips, uh, you know, a roll, a sandwich and things like that. You're going to exceed your carbohydrate intolerance most likely. And um, 
how do you know that you've probably got a reduced carbohydrate intolerance? You've got extra weight around the midsection. And it's weight around the midsection that is unhealthy. It's called visceral fat. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've got two types of weight around the midsection. If you jump up and down and it jiggles just straight under the skin, that's not too bad. That's called subcutaneous fat. But it's the stuff inside your belly, in, you know, where the organs are, that can restrict your lungs' breathing ability. And right now, you know, with the virus happening and things like that, it's not whether we're going to get infected. We're probably all going to get infected. But whether we get sick or whether we really fall fair poorly or even die. And it's the people with the insulin resistance. That, you know, and the good news you know, that is that this can be dealt with. This risk factor can be reduced in days or weeks by eating the foods that you have right behind you. Even before weight loss occurs, uh, people can dramatically reduce their risk factor. So that's really exciting. But uh, I'm glad you mentioned knives and forks over hands because one of the key messages I wanted to share today is not so much what we eat, but when we eat and how we eat. So when we eat, uh, and I think we did refer to it previously, is that we want to maximize our non-eating window. So let's say, Steve, what time did you have dinner last night? I had my dinner at uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock. Okay, that's pretty early. That's fantastic. Um, and so what, have you had a meal this morning? No, I've just had my, my, my cup of tea. I've actually reduced my coffee a little bit now, so back onto my green tea. Uh, okay, so, so what, what time do you intend eating? Uh, probably, I would say around lunchtime. I, I don't get hungry in the morning, and I only, I, when I do exercise, it's usually in the evening or afternoon. Okay, so you're a, what we call a natural intermittent faster. So let's, let's calculate it. Let's say you had your dinner at six o'clock and your, your, your first meal of the day is at 12 o'clock, which is completely healthy. So the, the, the whole notion of, you know, breakfast is the most important rule of the, uh, meal of the day, that was created by cereal manufacturers, that belief system. That's a nonsense. But from six in the morning, to midnight is six hours plus 12 is 18 hours. So your non eating window is 18 hours. And for many people, that is one of the best strategies they could have uh, to uh, bring down their insulin levels, let their pancreas, uh, you know, sort of get back to normal levels. And particularly if they're suffering insulin resistance to get it down, you know, so, uh, you know, simply del as a matter of fact, my wife, Ellen, she eats roughly the same as you. Her first meal is at uh, 12. Now she used to be a breakfast eater and she said, Oh, I wonder if I could just comfortably do it. It's much easier to go to a, um, a narrow eating window, which is a larger non eating window. Um, if you've already adapted your body to a low carb regime, which is very, low in carbohydrates. And if we look at the foods behind you, if somebody just ate that, you've got all the proteins, the fish, the egg, the meat, but all those vegetables, you know, there's not many starchy vegetables there, just a, you know, a couple of pieces of fruit, you know, low sugar fruit. So that is a very low carb routine. And if your body had adapted to that, uh, then minimizing your eating window or maximizing your non-eating window is pretty easy to adapt to. So, uh, so um, with me uh, getting up in the morning, <clears throat> having my green tea, or uh, I might sneak in a coffee every every second day, and then um, just I do my things for myself. I have actually a bit of a plan, and then I just go to work. I don't actually get hungry, and then um, then I'll have a bite. To it. My lunch is usually a little bit bigger. I don't like having big lunches, uh, big dinners, because um, uh, a little snack at dinner time, as I said yesterday, was at five, it's 5 30, 6 o'clock. It was just, um, you know, it was, a, it was pretty, a pretty simple snack, it was pretty of veggies. Um, mm -hmm. That was it. Um, it was quite small. Um, and then I just uh, do my thing. Uh, but uh, I've noticed when I, I'm on the road, when I'm doing a lot of in-house training, we have these breakfasts, these breakfast meetings, quite interesting. I'm not a big guy, um, but I can assure you, if I have these breakfast meetings at 7.30, having the coffee, having the, uh, the scrambled eggs or whatever the case may be, if I do that, I say two or three times in a week, and, um, and then I go back to my regime, I feel sluggish yeah, and, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't put on weight easily, but I, I can assure you it, it is my pants are a bit tighter just after a week or two of just not doing my routine. Is that what happens? 
absolutely. You, you know, we've got an incredible bo human body, which is amazingly adaptive. And, uh, you know, w we live in an abesogenic environment. And uh, so when we are almost force feeding ourselves, particularly the wrong foods, uh, then your body responds by accumulating body weight and, um, and you do become sluggish. Your energy levels go down because when we think, you know, nutritionists talk, tell us that there are three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Actually, there are four. There's protein, carbohydrates, fats, and alcohol. And particularly in times of stress, many, many Australians and people from all around the world self-medicate with alcohol at the end of the day. So we've actually got four macronutrients of course, alcohol is a toxin and it's, it's non-nutritive, but you know, it doesn't have any nutritional benefits. But your body actually has access to two other sources of energy, apart from what you eat, which is sugar in your bloodstream and sugar that your, your body can create for itself and body fat. And for, unfortunately for most people, they don't have access to their own body fat for energy. Clearly you do, because you're quite comfortable going from six you know, in the evening all the way through midday completely comfortable, not, e not even thinking about food, unless you're sort of socially eating. And so, so you've, a, uh, a food, you've got access to your own stored body fat. There's food for fuel, not for comfort. So a lot of people get into this isolation at the moment and they're eating for comfort and comfort foods are the breads and the, the chips and, and those things. It's a comfort food. And, uh, you know, Jeff Jowett the, 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 talks about it quite regularly. Um, have your food for fuel, but not for comfort and um, ha have something that will fill you up for comfort, which will be naturally based. Would that be a good? Scenario? Oh, absolutely. And, and particularly because so much of it is uh, either habitual eating. Mm. You know, I think I probably habitually eat breakfast because I want to do something like that. And I enjoy the ritual of cooking a breakfast. Um, and, and then you've got the, the social eating as well. And then we've got isolation eating as well. You know, so um, there's a whole lot of triggers and some, you just have to say a lot of those triggers. And uh, the, the fact that you mentioned that you're pre, you've got a pre-planned schedule, a schedule that works for you uh, is really important. Now, there's another tip I'd like to share with everybody, and that is uh, the way we eat. And um, think about, particularly if you're in a social situation, it's interesting to think who starts eating first. I've got a friend, good old buddy Grant, you might've met him. And <laughs> you know, we're, we're into dessert before he started eating his main course. So uh, slow down your eating to give your body a chance for, to get a blood sugar response. And you'll definitely eat less if you slow down your eating. So, um, and, and the other way to slow down, as you mentioned, is to, eat with a knife and fork and put your knife and fork down between bites. If you look at people who are struggling with their weight in cafes and restaurants and Ellen, my wife tells me, don't stare, you're staring, don't stare. But I, I, I really like observing human behavior. I'm sure a lot of us like observing human behavior. And when I see people who are struggling with their weight, one thing I do notice is as soon as that meal arrives, they host straight in and, um, and they don't put their knife and fork down between bites. It's just like, it's a race. And, and they'll get in a lot of calories before their body can even respond to say, you are sated, you are satiated, you know? So uh, put your knife and fork down, have a chat, you know, read a book or whatever, it, you know, it's just a good habit to do. So a, a, to eat sm slowly um, is better. Now there, there's, is this a myth or is this a fact? Um, it's not a good idea to drink lots of fluid while you're eating. Um, it's better to do, uh, to um, have fluid afterwards, or is it uh, is it a good idea to have a glass of wine while you're eating? Um, I've had so many different things about fluid while you're eating. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Jamie? You know, I don't have any thoughts on it, Steve. Uh, one of the the most liberating things that I've learned is I don't need to have an answer to every question and whatever feels naturally to you. But I, I, I definitely don't have a definitive answer where I could dictate you either drink fluids with your meal or do not drink fluids with the meal. Personally, I think it's a good idea to maintain hydration. As we get older, one of the things that often departs is thirst as a warning signal for hydration. And so we've, we see nurses, as soon as they come in contact with 
a, uh, an elderly person in a nursing home or a hospital, you know what they'll do? They'll pinch their skin to see how quickly the skin returns to normal because typically if the skin stays up, it's an indication that they might be dehydrated. Wow. wow. And so that's what they'll do. You, you watch nurses, you know, particularly the older nurses, they'll just, hello, love, and they'll pinch their skin to see if they're dehydrated. If they're not, and they typically don't feel thirsty, they'll put them on the drip. Wow. Yeah, because you know, they're at risk because uh, they're dehydrated. So if someone wanted to get healthy and uh, not take one of those things that you actually uh, did the other day when you said you were unhealthy, when clearly you're not, um, what would be uh, two or three things that uh, based on would the, the time they'd eat and, and the, the, the things they would eat, what do you think other than the, the things behind me? I mean, uh, they, there is a steak there, as you suggested, uh, but uh, no food labels. Make sure that uh, predominantly um, eat with uh, when you're hungry, not when you think you should. Would that be a, a tip? Absolutely. And in, in the previous sessions, we've used the phrase prioritize protein. And, okay. and so this is really important. You know, whether you're whatever style or ideology you have about, you know, foods and what's healthy and it's not, your body has a requirement for a certain amount of protein and whatever your food choices, you'll keep on eating until you've met your protein needs. And there's been some really fascinating research on this, that if people have a very low protein diet, they eat more calories. But if they've got a higher protein diet, they eat less calories. Now calories count, but you don't have to count them. So if you prioritize, whether you have one meal a day, two meals a day, or three meals a day, or even three meals and two snacks, in each one of those meals, make sure you're getting some quality, adequate protein. And when I say quality, which is highly bioavailable, that tends to be animal proteins. Of course, if you're vegetarian, for whatever reason, there are uh, um, non-animal proteins, but it's much easier to meet your protein needs from fish, meat, and eggs. All right. Terrific. Um, oh, and, and, uh, and dairy, of course, is a, can be a great source of protein. Got a question for Michelin in the chat box. We got said, how about juicing? Uh, she agree. She does green juice in the mornings. And how does that work with intermittent fasting? Well, um, you, you just have to be a little bit careful with juicing because, uh, uh, and it was great that you're doing green juicing because greens have a very low carbohydrate yield. Um, and, uh, but I would add some protein, some protein powder into that juice, you know, because prioritizing protein and, um, but you have to be very careful with juicing, particularly if people are going to be juicing fruits, because, you know, if, if I gave you, uh, three apples or four apples, you say, I, I, I can't eat all those, but if I juice them, it would be easy to wash them down and pretty quickly, you know? So, uh, Whereas uh, there's not absolutely nothing wrong with juicing, make sure you get some protein with it. So some people juice and put whey protein powder you know, in it and, um, or something like that to make sure you're getting your protein in because you just don't want to have carbohydrates by themselves. I you recall know, so. last week, Jamie, you were talking about lactose. So lact if you actually take in that carbs and it goes into lactose, all of a sudden that will then turn in, uh, actually into uh, energy, which is fat. So, well, of course, lactose, you know, anything ending in OSE is a sugar mm. you know, that converts uh, into uh, blood glucose, glucose in, your, in your bloodstream. Uh, now, there are some people, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Steve, because I wanted to have it as one of our lessons this morning. When people go on the eating plan that you have right behind you, which I think is a fantastic eating plan, uh, typically what they're not going to be eating and what we don't see there is bread or flour, but wheat, and we don't see dairy there. <clears throat> now, when people go on a very, very low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet, <clears throat> often we remove both dairy and, um, and we remove wheat. And, and often people say, gee, I feel better. The bloating is gone. You know, my head fog is gone. Even my joints feel better. My skin and hair, <coughs> excuse me, feel better. And, um, and so, so sometimes this can be the sign of they are either lactose intolerant and or uh, they are gluten 
or something or, or something else in the wheat in torrent. Now, uh, this is what the one I want to point out is how do you know whether you're either lactose intolerant or wheat gluten intolerant? And I didn't use, um, of course, there are people who are celiac. They are completely allergic to gluten. This is different. These are non-celiac gluten intolerance. Um, because you see, somebody might take the dairy out of their diet and say, oh, I didn't feel any better. So obviously it's not dairy. And then they take the wheat out of their diet and they say, I didn't feel better. So obviously it's not wheat was, is my problem. But the problem is you might be intolerant to both wheat and dairy. So just removing one at a time doesn't work for you. You've got to remove them both, have a washout period, maybe two or three or four or sometimes even six weeks, and then reintroduce uh, just one at a time to see how your body responds. And if you, if you start getting some type of inflammation or you're not sleeping well or your bloating returns, then that's pr your body telling you. Because as I've said in previous uh, sessions, I am not a dietary expert. I am not a nutritional expert. As a matter of fact, Steve, when it comes to your body, I'm not the expert. As a matter of fact, when it comes to Michelin, when it comes to her body, she's not the expert, which is her beliefs. The only expert for her body is her body and her body's responses to various foods. So if you go back to bare bones basic, like what you've got behind your screen there, um, as long as you don't have a nut intolerance because you've got some nuts there as well, but go back to bare bones basics, don't be surprised you find, ha, huh, I'm starting to feel much better. Because all, you, all, all your readers and followers, one thing they have in common, they all earn their living from their neck up they're information workers. Michelin said she is really an information worker. She's driving or talking, driving or talking, walking to the back of a van, you know, driving or talking. And, and she's denying her body physical activity. Probably she doesn't have the energy because of the way she's been eating for the last few years has actually cut off her access to her own stored body fat. But by eating the foods that you have behind you and prioritizing protein, it wouldn't surprise me if her energy levels went up, her body fat went down, and being physically active, active is much easier for her. That's terrific. She actually asked another question, Jamie. She said, how about animal fat as in lamb? Um, is the, is the, I would say the, the, the protein is fine, but the, the fat that's in there, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I did say the carrot count, you don't have to count them. And, and I really encourage you to have naturally occurring fats. Now, I'm assuming that uh, the picture behind you, there is a, uh, a vase of oil, and I'm assuming that that's like extra virgin olive oil. What I would encourage everybody to avoid are the manufactured oils, the polyunsaturated seed oils and margarine and things like that. You know, they really have no place in a human diet and very inflammatory. But the naturally occurring fat in fish or in, uh, or in um, uh, red meat or in eggs, because... People say eggs are a good source of protein, but on a curry basis, there's more calories from fat than protein. So they are, you know, and all the health authorities around the world say, even though eggs are a high fat protein food, <laughs> um, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Um, but uh, there is no, no reason, no health reason not to have as many eggs as you wish. So uh, have the naturally occurring fat, you know, that's naturally in the fish, that's naturally in the meat, that's naturally in the eggs, that's naturally in the milk, you know, but don't, don't have all the fast release carbohydrates from the cereals and grains and things like that. But if you, if you, if you improve your health and you find, gee, I want to test myself to see if I can have cereals and grains, knock yourself out. So um, there's a, uh, I know that I don't eat a great deal of wheat and I know lots of, my friends actually eat it every day. Uh, wheat bix in the morning, they have toast in, and um, there's always having wheat. And I've known some of them that have just said, I'm just going to try to go uh, on a, a, a go cold turkey on wheat. And it's quite difficult. However, once they've actually done it, it's the one thing that's been universal. And uh, since I've been talking to them about these sorts of things over the last few years is if they just took out wheat, because sugar was a little bit more difficult in some cases, um, they 
actually lost weight quite quickly, but also felt a lot more, how, how could I say, energy, uh, because it was something they were eating a lot of, but they didn't realize how much wheat they were eating. Oh, absolutely. And there's a famous book called Wheat Belly by uh, uh, the US cardiologist, Dr. William Davis. I know Bill Davis. He's a lovely guy. And um, it's well worth reading that book. I've got two friends that are roughly my age who both suffered and have been medicated for good gastric reflux. Okay. And, you know, quite painful and stops them sleeping and getting good night's sleep is absolutely crucial for your energy level and for weight control because lack of sleep is a hormonal disruptor. And even though they've been medicated for like decades, I said, do yourself a favor, just take wheat and beer, uh, the, the take wheat and beer out of your diet uh, for two to four weeks and let your body, because your body's the true expert, tell you uh, whether you feel better or worse. Within seven days, both of them could stop, take, get a good night's sleep without medication. And they'd been medicated for decades. And, and this is extremely painful. So they just took the wheat out of their diet. Now, is it the gluten? Is it gliadin, you know, which is another protein in wheat? I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. Because, and, and is there evidence for or against that? I don't know and I don't care because I want to leave this phrase with everybody. To them, it was self-evident. Okay, self-evident. I biohacked. I did something different, took something out of my diet and monitored my body's response. So your body's the only expert. It's not your beliefs. Oh, I believe this or I believe that. It's what your body believes if you put it through the test. And so, and, and what did I charge them? I didn't charge them anything. And they had spent probably thousands of dollars with medical tests and seeing doctors and things like that. Not one of them said, have you tried just taking wheat out of your diet and all wheat products and beer? That's absolute gold. Mm. What I, I love hearing about uh, stories where people have just uh, taken something out of their diet or put something in and all of a sudden things changed. <laughs> I remember many years ago, Jamie, and as you would know, um, uh, for a long, long time there, I was presenting around the world nearly every second day and, uh, you know, 200, 230 days stand-ups in, in 365. And after a little while, I started to get really sore legs. And I just thought I was standing up for two longer days. Anyway, um, again, a long story short, I went to the physio. I said, oh, oh, my legs are really sore. And he said, oh, I think your hamstrings are too tight to do stretches. And I went, hmm. So um, I went to a, another lady who was a doctor and also a uh, naturopath, and she took my blood. And she had a look at it. She said, oh, good grief. Um, um, I, I think you've got a bit of a problem here with your um, magnesium. She said, um, Interesting. Uh, I'm going to get you to take these powder now. And she gave me magnesium powder whoop, whoop. and um, she said, uh, and I wanted to buy these. Obviously, it's a profit center, but obviously that was okay. I can assure you, mate, just by just changing that. And I took these tablets and powder and got on the train at Chatswood going back to uh, my place. By the time I've got home, my aching legs had subsided. Not, it wasn't gone. The next day, because she said to have a magnesium bath, which is just putting that powder in the bath. Sure, yeah. Um, it was gone. There was Amazing. this, I, I, I'm not kidding. I, it was, she said that my magnesium was so low that it started leaching it from my, from my bones. Yeah. That's where the and, pain and, was and mag, yeah, magnesium, you know, and, you know, vitamin D and things like that, that, you know, these are typically very low and there's no harm in adding magnesium. And if it makes a difference, gee, good on you. Your body's taught you a lesson. Oh, it was actually, as, as you were saying, it's my, my body was saying, this is sore, go do stretching. And then I just took this stuff, but I was n not taking enough because I don't go in the sun. My doctor told me that I should be taking vitamin D, but I also found out that it also has some wonderful anti-carcinogenic activities too. So three or four of them a day and some magnesium and I don't have uh, achy, painy legs or anymore. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Now, Steve, uh, of, of the people watching, uh, are there any specific questions we've triggered, I wonder? Terrific. Uh, now, uh, Michelin and Lloyd. Um, um, Lloyd, do you have do you have any questions? Uh, Michelin's actually asked one or two. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, can you ask uh, a question? Take you off moot, or just put it in the chat box, Lloyd. Don't know if you are in the car driving or whatever the case may be. You might just be <laughs> listening. Maybe he's driving. Okay, Michelin. Have you got anything you'd like to take you off mute and just ask Jamie? 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Jamie. That's really um, uh, helpful and enlightening and reminding. So when I started with Niagara Therapy 12 years ago, I'd gone on to a diet where um, I, I cut out, uh, I don't know if you know of Dr. Cohen, but I cut out dairy. Oh, yes. I, yeah. I cut out dairy and I cut out um, breads, uh, you know, carbohydrates. I limited those and um, I increased all the natural healthy foods. And by golly, I felt so much better. Um, I think you've nailed something very obvious for me, which you probably know and you mentioned. Um, comfort eating has been a big part of what I've done. Um, but currently, I'm doing daily half an hour walk on my treadmill. Fantastic. I'm doing the juice. I don't put anything that's um, sweet in it except the green apple. Um, I will go into intermittent fasting because I think it's heard, but the evidence that you gave today made it a lot um, better. Um, uh, well, I did have a question. I'm trying to think. Um, so when, when <laughs> I eat pretty late, and I do suffer good. And I've just gone back to taking, because I'm also a singer, and um, my voice box for now, the last 10 years, has just pretty much been stuffed because of all the acid reflux. And um, I needed to do a gig a while ago. And so I start, I've gone back onto the Nexium. What are your thoughts? I have no <laughs> thoughts about Nexium. I'm not a doctor, and uh, that's something you should speak to your doctor. But, you know, if you can, just by following some simple diet tips, if you can reduce your need for it, you know, and, and you have a chat with your doctor, then and they say, look, <laughs> so your symptoms have subsided. I think you can go without it. Fantastic. But uh, really, so I have no thoughts about it whatsoever. Yeah. But, but look, I really just encourage you to be completely disciplined, at least for 60 days, and say, I'm not going to have any processed food. I am going to prioritise protein because I... I think people, people avoid, don't get enough protein uh, and that stimulates their diet because uh, they, they don't have optimal protein status. Uh, so I would make sure you get some you know, protein. I wouldn't worry about the fat so much. Just keep that carbohydrate level way down from all sources, healthy or not, and uh, make sure you avoid those polyunsaturated seed oils as well. Yeah. You know, and I think if you, if you follow that, it wouldn't surprise me if many of your symptoms uh, reduce. Well, I well, I hope they will. So, you know, it would be lovely, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Just one last question. Um, what What's with um, something like sweet potato? Um, is that sort of too much of a high carbohydrate as well? Is that something? Well, for some, for some people it is, you know, and uh, yeah, you may want to talk to your doctor about okay. uh, uh, of of not just getting your blood sugar tested, but getting your insulin, your fasting insulin levels tested. Because yeah. sometimes people have normal blood sugar and the doctor says, oh, you're completely fine. But remember, insulin is the hormone that balances the blood sugar. And if your body is working too hard and your insulin levels are up here, so your blood sugar on a blood sugar test is normal, but you, you've got suffering hyperinsulinemia, um, but it goes completely undiagnosed over a period of not months and years, but decades. When we're swimming in high insulin levels, our cells become insulin resistant. And uh, there's one little test you can do, which we did mention previously. Just get out of Go to Coles or Woolies and get a 50 cent uh, tape measure, put it around your waist. If your waistline is 50% or greater than your height, so let's say if your height's 160, if your waistline is 80 centimetres or more, I'd be talking to your doctor about getting your insulin levels measured and testing for insulin resistance, you know, uh, which, which is a precursor of so many other metabolic issues. And luckily, simply by following the dietary guidelines we've been discussing, it's a way to immediately bring them down. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to really honour your body. <laughs> And uh, be completely selfish about it, completely. And I, I would also encourage you to keep a record saying, oh, I ate this. This is, how, this is how my energy levels were. This is what my sleep quality was like. This is how refreshed I woke up in the morning. Uh, you know, and um, you know, I, I, I felt hungry at these times, but it was not real hunger, it was habitual hunger or stress-related hunger or, or something like that. So if you start journaling, uh, then you can you know, 
uh, associate, oh, I did this or I didn't do this. I took this, I added this to my diet or took this out of my diet or I changed my eating times. And this is how my body responded. Remember, the only true expert when it comes to your body is your body. Thanks. That's, That's great advice, Jamie. Um, I've got Lloyd just typed in um, a question in the chat box. He says, uh, thanks, Jamie. Love the concept of your body knows, not your beliefs and also prioritizing proteins. I've done intermittent, mis, intermittent fasting and it works a treat. Thoughts on multivitamins taken. Also, I'd like, um, I'd like it as an insurance, uh, almost like an insurance policy. So what's your thoughts on multivitamins taken when you're doing well, you know, I, you know, I used to recommend them um, uh, to everybody, you know, because a lot of people suffer from nutrient deficiency stimulated appetite. And sometimes it's not just that they're not eating a nutrition, a nutrition, a nutritious diet, but they're not absorbing it. You know, they've got gut related issues and things like that. So I'm completely uh, agnostic when it comes to multivitamins. You know, if, um, if you want to take it as an additional insurance policy, I don't see any reason not to. Personally, I don't. I do take uh, fish oil tablets and vitamin B3 because my dermatologist has said that may be slightly protective because I'm prone to skin cancers and things like that. So I am a vitamin taker because I take those specific vitamins. Um, and uh, there's good arguments and there's other experts that could give a better viewpoint. There are doctors I know who do extensive blood chemistries to see what your nutrient needs are and whether, whether you're absorbing, you know, and you've got optimal chemistries. And that's a pretty interesting field. So if anybody um, was really suffering and, and didn't have the answers or hadn't struggled to find the answers, definitely I'd be happy to refer them to, to, to a specialist who actually measure your, your blood chemistries to see what your specific vitamin needs are. Or, and often it's not just vitamins, but minerals as well, you know. Uh, and sometimes it's not lack of minerals, but too much, you know, um, you know, uh, or elements such as mercury and lead and things like that. We, li we live in a toxic world and uh, our body has to deal with that. That's great. Well, look, uh, Jamie, if there's any, unless there's other more, any more questions for Michelin uh, or, or uh, young Lloyd, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Michelin, got any more questions for Jamie? Not that I can think of at the moment. It was a pleasure listening to you. And I'm sure this is going to become something I'm taking lots of copious notes. Well, Michelin, I wish you all the best. And if you, I would go from here straight to your pantry. If you've got any processed food, throw it out. And, uh, <laughs> I was uh, really and good before fresh. this. I was My... really good. Sorry. I was really good before the COVID, but then I went and bought all this flour and started cooking again. <laughs> Well, I bet you, you cook beautifully, you know, so good on you, but it may not be serving you. And I, particularly if you're traveling around, eat local fruits and vegetables in season. And Steve, if you'll just permit me just one extra minute. My aunt Mickey, unfortunately she's passed away. She would say eat local fruits and vegetables in season. See, our mothers and grandmothers knew the seasons for apples, oranges, peaches and pears. But now that's knowledge that we don't have anymore. We're just told to have two pieces of fruit every day, wherever it comes from, anywhere around the world. Think of those food miles. You know, I think that's a complete nonsense. But if you're traveling around, look at what is local by the local producers. Go to the farmers, you know, and, uh, and meet them and see if they're spraying <laughs> what they're spraying on their foods or whatever like that. So, um, but, you know, local fruits and vegetables in season and, you know, meats, fish, eggs, dairy. I, I think it's pretty hard to go wrong. Terrific. Well, uh, thanks, Jamie. As always, uh, absolute gold. And it was terrific having Lloyd and uh, Michelin on there. Great questions, guys. Thanks for joining us today. And, uh, but uh, all the good stuff that Jamie's given us, if you don't take action on it, it's just great uh, info. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, the do, it's the doing that's really important. If you take two or three things that you learned today, um, you're going to take some action. Now, what I'll ask you to do is 
after we're done, we're going to wrap up now. Just go into the, the sack and actually type in one thing or two things that Jamie taught you today that you're going to take some action. So it puts it out there into the universe and it's actually there and it will remind you there. So Micheline and Lloyd, just go into the sack, say, I went to did, did a session with Jamie at Nutrition Tips Tuesday and I learned this and I'm going to put this into action. And that's going to put it into your subconscious so you can actually uh, get out there and do it. Maybe two or three things, but uh, at least one. Could you do that for me? All right. Good. All right, Jamie, thanks again, mate. I really appreciate it. And uh, I can't wait to see the, the outcomes. I'm actually going to have a Bo Peep in mind. I, I think I've only got uh, olive oil. I got no bread, no nothing. I think I need to go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Steve, all the best this week to you and your members. Thanks, mate. Okay, gang, <clears throat> make sure you join us for next Tuesday at nine o'clock for uh, Nutrition Chips Tuesday. And you can actually have uh, your, your chin wag with, with Jamie and get some great stuff. All right, guys. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you during the week. Bye for now.